workshop, we're going to be covering functional programming with R. Um, we're largely going to focus on the per package. Um, and I'm not even going to touch any of the base functional programming concepts, really. So um, we'll spend most of the kind of um, start of this session running through a lot of the theory on functional programming um, before touching on some exercises at the end. Um, just as a little session outline, um, going to kind of first cover what are functions and why we want to write functions before touching briefly on what functional programming is. Um, functional programming does have a bit of a reputation in computer science as being a, a, a complex topic, and it's, it's largely because it's been driven and designed by academia. Um, so a lot of the concepts end up just being directly borrowed from maths. Um, we're going to skip over all of that complexity. Um, so, so yeah, we're not fully going to teach functional programming, but we're going to teach the important bits, I think. Um, yeah, then I'm going to quickly run through um, what functions the per package has, and I'm um, going to spend most of our time focusing on the, the map function um, and its variants, because that's probably the most useful um, part. But we'll touch on some of the other more useful functions. Um, we're certainly not going to cover everything in per because I think there's about 140 or 150 different functions um, in total. Um, but you know, we'll go through the, the ones that are most important. Um, and I'm going to very quickly touch on how to do um, parallel computation using the per package, which is an amalgamation of the future package and per into one. Um, so very briefly, um, I work for the strategy unit. We're based within the Midlands and Lancashire Commissioning Support Units. So we're all NHS staff driven by NHS um, goals and visions. Um, we largely focus on kind of um, consultancy work. Um, so we bid for and um, run kind of large analytical projects. Um, you can see some of our work on our GitHub repository, which I've linked in the slides, um, or some of the more written kind of pieces on the website. Um, and then myself, I've, I have um, over 10 years, it's probably more like 12 years experience now in the NHS across the um, acute sector and more recently in the kind of a commissioning support side. Um, backgrounds in computer science and pure maths. Um, I'm a member of the British Computer Society and a member of Institute of Mathematics and its applications. I should have put AFA as well. I'm a member of AFA. Um, active member of the NHSR community, senior fellow of the NHSR Academy. And you can follow me on those links um, for Twitter and GitHub, both at Tom Jenner. So enough about me. Right. First of all, the big question is, what is a function? Um, I've tried to find a good definition somewhere online, and I've never really been able to find a nice definition of this is what a function is. So, borrowed from this um, <laughs> JavaScript website, um, what are functions? And it's kind of classed them into three different groups. So, um, a function is a process which takes some input called arguments and produces some output called a return value. The three different kinds of function that he's defined here are mappings. So a mapping could just take some argument, transforms it to another value and returns that. It does nothing else. It, it's not changing the state of the computer in any way. So the state being you know, some other bits of memory. Um, it's not doing any input or output. It's not reading any files from disk or connecting to the web. It's literally just mapping one thing to the other. Um, the next kind of function type is a procedure. So, you know, this is a bit more of a complex example. Um, this is kind of implementing something in computer science called stack, where it just builds up items one after another. You'd normally have a corresponding pop function that would take the values off. But in this, we've got some kind of global variables, um, the counter, so just how many things are in the stack. 
and the stack itself. And every time you, you call push with an argument X, it's going to store that value at the next point in the stack. So in contrast to that mapping, this is doing a couple of other bits. It's, it's not returning a value as such. It's changing the state outside of the program, well, sorry, outside of the function in the program. Um, we'll kind of see why we don't favor that in functional programming as we go on. Um, and the next kind of function then, these are things that we're familiar with, like input and output functions, um, things that are going to read from disk or write to disk. They're going to go to a database and get values for us. Um, you know, they're achieving some change in the state of the computer rather than the state of the program. Um, so, you know, I've got a link here. This is a, for, it's based in JavaScript, but the content is very accessible. You don't need to understand JavaScript to run through it. Um, so it's well worth having a look at that website at a later date. I've got that in the references section at the end. Um, and it, very quickly, I just wanted to touch on vectors in R um, because vectors are going to be our arguments to functions. Um, so we've got a couple of different types of vectors. The ones that we use to are the, the atomic vectors, things like um, a list of numbers, one, two, three, or um, characters, yeah, hello world. Um, the, the key thing with these atomic vectors is all of the values have to be the same type. If we had that numbers one, two, three, and we tried to put hello into that, it's going to change one, two, and three to be one as a string, two as a string, three as a string. Um, yeah. In this, the um, types are homogenous. They're all of the same type. The next kind of type is the list data type. Um, and these are, these are more complex. So a list can either store an atomic vector like those one, two, threes, hello world as before. Or it can also store another list. Um, it, it can also store things like functions and environments, but we'll gloss over that. Um, so yeah, the important thing with lists is the, the data doesn't have to be of the same type, um, the heterogeneous. Um, and it, the other thing is the items don't need to be the same length. So we've got three items here, two items there, and this is one item that has two items within it. Um, so yeah, the other thing is vectors can be named. So here we've got um, the values one and two, and one has a name A, two has a name B. Um, so data frames that we know and love are just lists. So the difference between a data frame and a list is that a data frame has a, cl a class called you know, data.frame, but it's stored as a list where each column is one of these items in the list. And the name of those items in the list is the name of the column. Um, this will be important later just to understand because as we start looking at some of the functions in per that work on lists, because they work on lists, they can work on data frames. Um, and then we've got matrices and arrays, which are 2D and ND versions of the atomic vectors. Um, I'm not going to touch on those today. Um, there are some considerations that you need to make for those kind of um, vectors um, if you're trying to use some of the stuff later on. And I, I'm not going to touch on that at all today, but you can reach out to me if you have particular use cases for matrices. Um, the one thing to note is if you were to try and use some of the stuff later on, um, even though that you know, a matrix it has a rows and columns, it's still just a, a big long list of numbers that can be stretched out into a one dimensional vector, which is the kind of caveat that if you were to use some of the stuff later on with these matrices and arrays, you may get weird results. Any questions so far? I'm, I'm rattling through um, quite a large field of um, how data is stored in R. Okay, um, yes, so I saw a hand up.
Come on, unmute. Or just ask in the chat. No, sorry, that was a mistake. I accidentally pressed it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I should make you ask a question now, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'm not going to be that mean. Um, so yeah, we've looked at functions quickly. We've looked at vectors. Um, the other thing, um, if this is confusing, don't worry too much about it, but th the notion of environments in R. So when you start off and you just open up R and you've got the console there, you're in the global environment. So you can create variables there, you can create functions and this, that, and the other. Um, and they're stored in the global environment. Um, if we're then to create this function like I've got on the left, that's right. <laughs> um, it, it takes an argument y, um, but it's also using the, the variable x from the global environment. So this function can see the stuff that's in its parent or parents um, environment. Um, but the one thing that will happen is when we change this value here, it's not going to change the value of x. Um, and when we create this variable z in the function, it's only going to exist in the functions environment. So as you can see in this kind of code snippet, we create the function, we evaluate it and store it in the um, variable results or result. Um, but then back in the global environment, if we say, does the variable z exist? No. And what's the value of x? Well, I'm expecting x to equal two. So we've got one multiplied by two, one multiplied by two. But it's only going to be two within that function's environment. And the function's environment is only going to exist when it's that function is executed. So we run the function, it creates a new environment, it does all the stuff in the environment, and then that disappears at the end. Um, um, the one thing that you yeah, might have spotted earlier on when I showed that, um, the kind of stack push example is this um, bit of a weird operator, which is it's like a normal assignment operator, but it's got two um, little arrows first. That is the it it it's kind of like the global assignment variable operator. So in this example, if we change that to two arrows, it will first look and see does X exist in the parent environment, and it will see it and it will update it there. Um, So that, that's environments. It's not the most important thing to know in the world, but understanding how kind of functions store the values and um, modify them is quite useful, particularly this, um, what they call copy and modify semantics. So if you're used to um, other programming languages, um, Python's probably not a good example there, but maybe JavaScript, um, this would update that variable X in the the parent environment and change its value. Um, that Python kind of makes you be explicit about changing these things. Um, but yeah, R instead uses what's called copy on modify. So when it sees that you've got this variable and you're updating it here, but it's in a new environment, it will copy that variable. So you've in a sense got two copies of X. It's just that it's going to see its own copy in its environment. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, as I say, it, probably not the most important things to fully understand ever. Right. So the next question that sh we should be asking is, why do we want to write functions? So as so he's kind of just pointed out, some of the text isn't showing very clearly. Sorry. Um, if you, if, you, if you follow through the, the link and view it on your own computer if you want, um, we'll be on slide eight. But this is um, an example gratefully stolen from the R for DS book. Um, and what it's trying to do here is update the um, these vectors. So you've got a data frame for, with four columns, and they're just some random values. Um, and it's going to re try and re rescale the value. So the smallest value gets a value of zero, the biggest value gets a value of one, and then the rest of the values are still spaced out as they were before through the rest of the vector. But 
can you spot the mistake somewhere in this code? I'll give you a few minutes. Someone raise the hand or shout in the chat once to spot the mistake. Okay, I see your hands up. Nick? Uh, yeah, so it's the, the classic copy paste fail. I think on the, it's the second line, but it's, you've split it over two lines. You've got min of D uh, dollar A, which is supposed to be dollar B, I presume. Yeah, exactly. So, it, yeah, uh, put your hands up if you've made this mistake in the past where you've had a bunch of code like this. It's really useful. You go, oh, OK, let's copy paste it and you forget to update one of the things. And especially with this, you are copying and pasting this. You've got to change the column that you're updating, the, the, you know, the vector that you're getting it from once, twice, three times, four times. Um, and we're repeating ourselves all over the place, min, min, max, loads of room from errors. So yeah, there's a mistake. Um, Creating a function will allow us to abstract away that underlying logic. Um, so I've just created this as a function called rescale01. Um, we pass in a you know, vector. We find the minimum value, maximum value. Save those as nice variables that we can kind of read clearly. And then return that value. So um, that's one thing I didn't make clear. Earlier on, if you aren't used to writing functions in R, the last line is always returned as a value. Um, you can use the return statement. Um, but I, I didn't want to make this a, a tutorial on writing functions. Um, but yeah, just the, the last line will be the return value. But yeah, so we create a function now. We've split out the, the logic so we can reuse it. And then we could simply just go each column, rescale, 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 rescale. Um, or we could even use a loop to kind of loop over the thing and call the function once um, for each thing. Um, you know, certainly this, I've still got the issue that I could use df.a here um, and make that same mistake again. In fact, a slightly worse version of the mistake. Um, because this time, instead of just having one part of this function wrong, the whole thing will be wrong. Um, yeah. Hey, anyway, yeah. Using loop is a better solution, but we'll look at how functional programming can make this an even more elegant solution later. So, yeah, this is the the concept in computer science of don't repeat yourself or dry. We, any time that we're copying and pasting, we're repeating ourselves. We're having that same logic over and over again, um, which is just going to cause problems. If if we spot it down the line at we didn't want to use the maximum value. We wanted to use like two thirds of the maximum value or something. We'd have to go back to that previous example and update each of those things and multiply by two thirds. And that's just going to get messy. Um, in this, we just update it once. So we abstract logic. We make it easier to fix errors if we spot them. Um, yeah, a, a huge host of benefits. I mean, the, the other one is it's making our codes much shorter instead of it being a page full of code, we can reduce it to just a handful of lines. And yeah, lines that can be shared across um, multiple other um, programs uh, or parts of your own program. So, right. so that's kind of covering the, the more base material of how we've done that. Um, the next part is what is functional programming? And um, again, I'm borrowing from that previous person. It's, just, it's got a series of these um, things about mastering the JavaScript interview, um, it's called. And he has a part of functional programming. And this is probably the best quote that I've seen of describing what functional programming is. Um, but it's, it's still quite wordy. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of concepts in there that you're probably not familiar with. And the, the last part of this quote does kind of say that functional programming can just become really dense, hard to read and understand. 
So I'm, I'm going to run for a couple of kind of um, concepts here that um, yeah, certainly what pure functions are. Um, we're not really going to touch on sh why we want to avoid shared state. So shared state would be we've got a variable stored in the global environment that our functions all use and reuse. This is typically bad um, for functional programming, um, well, just programming in general, um, because it's hard to know what those values may be when we're executing our functions, which leads to weird debugging issues. So we'll see how pure functions kind of simplify that problem without touching too much on the shared state part. Um, the other thing is that functional programming tends to avoid mutable data. Again, I'm not really going to touch on that. It's for the similar sort of reason, which I will try and explain when we're talking about pure functions. Um, and yeah, we're not going to touch too much on side effects because in actual fact, side effects are really useful. Um, who here has ever written a program that doesn't read any data from disk and doesn't save the data to disk in some way and doesn't output to your screen? <laughs> yeah, these are all things that are really useful. Um, and yeah, you may be thinking straight away, if we're avoiding all of those things, then is functional programming useful at all? Um, the way that functional programming tends to get around it is by using really complex wordy maths things that um, just make difficult to understand the literature, which is kind of the point that this person's making. But um, as we're kind of going to gloss over it and just do pretend functional programming, um, it's OK. We, we can not worry about that. So yeah, we're just going to worry about these pure functions. Um, the next part of the statement, functional programming is declarative rather than imperative. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, yeah, let's just move on to that. So, you know, this, this concept of declarative versus imperative first, this is not hugely important to understand this, but in, in declarative programming, we're writing stuff to say, do this thing, do that thing, then do the other. So it's just stepwise. We're writing big, long procedures. Um, so the, the source of this is cropped off the bottom of the page um, it's from um, an R website. This is something that just creates like a correlation plot and um, it's using base R graphics, which is very decorative in nature. And I have no clue what it's doing, to be honest, but yeah, it's setting some parameters for the plot. It's then creating some values. It's then creating the text. It's then you know, doing this, it's doing that. Um, so yeah, it's just stepping through line by line of altering the plot. And if anyone's ever watched base R plots, you'll probably know that you, you end up drawing a canvas and you put some plots on it and then you draw a line and then you add some labels and stuff like that. So it's adding things on piece by piece. Um, whereas GG plot is, is kind of more declarative. We say we want the plot to look like this. You don't care how it actually happens. You say I want points and I want a theme that has a red grid line and it, it does it. You don't worry about that actual um, kind of implementation. Um, probably the, the most common form of declarative programming is SQL. Uh, I, I mean, who's ever wondered how SQL is storing the data on disk and it's, how it's going to do the read operation off the, the IO, um, how it's going to go through and you know implement joins, it's going to do a hash join, a, a merge join, you yeah. know, is it going to need to sort the data? You don't care about that. You just write a query and let the, the database engine do its thing. So functional programming is more this decorative style that we let the computer figure out how to do stuff. We just describe what we want, which hopefully leads to neater, more understandable code. Um, if you're using dplyr, you're already doing very decorative programming. You know, we, we, we build a pipeline that says, you know, add some columns with mutate, then select some columns. You don't care about the details of how that is happening. You, you're just writing stuff that describes what you're doing. I think, well, you know, if you're using dplyr and you, you know, like dplyr, you're using it because of its decorative nature. It's easy to read and work with. Uh, anyway, um, the big thing of functional programming is we rely on these things called pure functions. So 
the definition of this uh, pure function is it's a function that always produces the same result given the same input. So if we were to run a function like um, getting the, the system um, date, if you run that tomorrow, you're going to get a different value. So we can never accurately predict ahead of time what that function is going to return unless we know something about the state of the computer. Whereas a pure function like this one here, x plus y, I mean, it's a really naughty example. But we know that if we put a value of 1 and a value of 10 there, it's always going to give us 11, no matter what computer we run it on, what time of day we run it on, um, you know, all those different things. A pure function will run the same. Um, so in order for that to work, we need to avoid side effects. We need to not read from disk in a pure function. Um, or you know, we can't write to disk even um, afterwards because that's affecting the state of the computer. Um, and we need to avoid that use of global state. So in this kind of slightly more complex example, um, it's a function that returns a function here. If we use this function, that value y is going to kind of be captured in the environment of this function. So this is a pure function as well, even though it's kind of closing the, the values. Um, but in the kind of non-pure example, so down here, um, this would be updating that value of this function here. Or this one here, we're using the value y that exists in the global environment. But the reason why you know, we want to avoid these is if this is something more complicated than just a numeric vector, it's much harder to test this stuff. So I've got to touch on some of the benefits afterwards. Um, but yeah, pure functions, non-pure functions. Um, if, if we've got any people from a mathematical background, pure functions are analogous to mathematical functions. Um, so for those of us not familiar with mathematics, um, a function in mathematics has a really neat definition in comparison to a, a programming um, language definition of a function. But a function in maths is a mapping from one set to another set, such that every value in the first set is mapped to a value in the second set, and it's mapped to exactly one um, value in the second set. Um, we don't need to worry about the definition of sets here. But, you know, a set could be numbers, it could be characters. Or in this um, example here that I stole from Wikipedia, um, you've got shapes on the left, and they're mapped to some color on the right. So you can see every everything over here has a um, an arrow coming out of it into the other set, um, and it has exactly one arrow coming out. Um, not everything in the second set has a, an arrow coming into it, though. That's fine. But if we, you know, we're translating this to a, a programming language example, um, we can then start being a bit more reassured about what the function is doing. If we know that it's always going to create a value in that other type, we can then pass it on to another function down the line and use that you know, in a kind of composed pipeline. So that's this kind of a notion of composition. If we've got two functions, you know, say this function here goes from one thing to another thing, and then our next function takes that, you know, thing, returns a third thing. We can simply create a new function by composing those two functions together. So we say g after f. Um, we, we're kind of doing that with deep player pipes. Um, we take the value of the one thing and we're passing it through all those other steps. We know if we start with a, a data frame and we've got a mutate statement, that's going to return a data frame that we can pass off to a select statement. Um, we can pass it off to a filter, you know, so long as it's continuing to return the data types that we're expecting, um, we can keep composing the results together. So kind of having this idea of what the thing starts with and what it's outputting is quite quite useful if we you know we know that it's always going to return that of a type we know we can use it with the next thing 
Um, right. So why do we care about pure functions? Um, don't worry about too much of the details on these, but one of the first reasons we care about pure functions is this concept of referential transparency. Um, if we have, you know, say, a function here that does this thing, and we have another function that uses the results of that, you, know, you could imagine this being in a pipe. Then if this is a pure function and we're always calling it with that value free, we just completely replace the function call with its value. So these two are equivalent. Um, that makes it a lot easier for debugging and testing as you write code. You know, if you're trying to test your code and you've got six different things that all rely on one another, if you could just say, mm, this thing should return a six, let's just test it with six and see what happens. We don't need to worry about the rest of the detail going forward. We can just kind of subtly replace that value for now, test it. It works, great. Or it doesn't, we can figure out the problem. I say, that doesn't make sense. It's not hugely important to worry about it. Um, computer scientists care about this. With the real world, probably don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, the next thing is kind of testing. Testing pure functions is a hell of a lot easier. So if anyone has written packages, you'll probably be used to the test that package. Um, if not, test that is for implementing what's called unit tests. And a unit test kind of looks like the thing on the right. Um, we say that we're going to test that this thing works. Um, and then we just write a bunch of expectations. So in this case, we've got, um, triangle numbers. If you can remember triangle numbers, you start off with one and then the next is you put two dots underneath it so we get one plus two, three. Um, put three more dots at the bottom, we get six, so on and so forth. So this is the pattern that we're expecting, one, three, six, ten, fifteen. Um, and we can just test that those functions that we've defined for this is giving us the value that we want. Um, if this wasn't a pure function and it was instead updating the global state or using some value from the global state, or it's doing some disk IO, we've got to handle those cases. I mean, we, you, I could run this test on my computer and have a file on my hard drive and it works. And then I give it to say Zoe and Zoe goes, the test fails. I haven't got that file on my hard drive. So yeah, now we need to make sure that that file always exists in every environment that we're testing or if we use some global variable, we need to make sure we set the global variables exactly before the test. Um, so yeah, the easier to work with. Um, the next one, this is kind of harder to explain, I guess, but if you want to do parallel computation, if you're relying on um, some global state and then trying to do parallel computation, depending on how those things are executed. So, you know, parallel computation, we say, we've got 10 CPUs here. Let's run that function 10 times on all of those different CPUs. And the computer goes, okay, I'll start thinking about doing that. Um, it schedules them all to run. And then as soon as that CPU becomes free, because, you know, we're sitting here on Teams, the CPU is doing a bit of thing on Teams. We've also got, um, you know, Outlook open. It's doing a little bit on Outlook. Um, so as soon as that CPU becomes available, go, okay, right, I'll jump on to do R thing now. Um, so we can't guarantee what order those functions going to evaluate in. Um, if we're relying on some global state, that global state could be very different depending on when the thing happens. Um, or even if those things all start at exactly the same time, that global state will be identical. Um, so yeah, writing code that kind of looks more like this. Um, don't worry about what that code is meant to be doing, just a, a toy example, but if we're relying on global state or IO, things like that, things may not work. Um, if anyone's written any SQL and seen like you've got um, tables are locked because there's something happening, it's for this reason, it's hard to um, work if you've got things that are being changed. 
potentially. So the best thing to do then is just stop everything from working until those changes are finished. We can move on. Um, pure functions, on the other hand, if all it's ever going to do is return the same value given the same input, it doesn't matter what order we execute them in. It, it doesn't matter um, you know, whether the first thing happens, the second thing happens, or you know, whether they all happen at the same time or one after the other. So it's super easy to parallelize these. Um, so I'll touch on this when we look at the fur package later. But yeah, writing stuff in this way, a lot easier to work with. Um, sorry, skip to the slide. So yeah, that, that's kind of the benefits of pure functions. Um, any kind of questions so far? I need a drink. I say there's a lot of theory. Um, some of it's probably less useful, but um, I'm hoping it gives a, a bit more of a strong backing so you kind of understand some of the concepts later on. All right, I don't see any questions. I like the theory, good. <laughs> I've got some very theoretical resources later that you can read through. And, uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, right. The, the, the next is this kind of concept of higher order functions. So, in R, um, functions what are called first class citizens. So, when we create a function, um, we will assign it to a variable. And that variable is just like any other variable. We can pass that variable off to a function. Or if we're in a function, we can return that variable. So that means that a, a function can take a function as an argument, or a function can return a function as an, a, a value. Um, well, let's see how this is quite a powerful um, kind of concept as we go forwards. Um, yeah, we've got this valid example down here of um, a function that takes a function and the value x, and what that's going to return is another function that takes value y, um, and then it evaluates that function with x and y. So this is what's called partial application, as an example here. Um, imagine we've got a function like um, the percent um, function from scales. So if you've used that, can, I, can you see the terminal? Is that popped up? Yes. But if I, so let's hope I've got scales installed. Scales percent, right. So if we put in scales percent, we get 43%. Um, and we can write something like accuracy equals um, 0.1. Maybe we want it to be two decimal places. But sometimes we'll be using that function inside of a, a, another place, and we'll just be passing um, it like that. So in particular, if you're using um, scale-wide continuous in ggplot, it's expecting you to pass a function. It's not expecting you to pass the evaluated function. So partial application would be to say, I want a new function that has the accuracy set like that, and then it expects a value. Um, in this case, the scales function actually already provides that. Um, so if you just run something like that, you'll see it's returning a, a um, function, which we could evaluate with some value. Um, three. Right. So that's the kind of idea of partial application. We create a new function from another function that's just slightly simplified. Um, so the per package, so this is our first introduction to per, has that. We, we can create a, a new function from the plus function that just accepts one argument instead of two. Um, and yeah, it just then always adds three to that variable. I mean, this is obviously a really stupid example. Why would you ever want to create a function that just adds three? <laughs> um, but as with that um, scales percent example, 
if that doesn't already provide the ability to partially apply the function, this just generalizes um, it to any function. So yeah, partial takes any function, and we can set any of the variables. Um, let me just show something. That, you know, could, instead of using that um, set format, we could do uh, partial, um, and you can name the argument. So that one. And uh, typo. So yeah, we get a partialized function, which we can run with 0.43 and get our value. So this is our first example of why functional programming is useful. We can take existing functions and make new functions that are you know, hopefully more useful for us. All right. Um, I'm just taking a quick break just because I've seen some messages popping up on the slide. Um, okay, they're just um, chats. I've, I've dealt with all those. Just finding your further reading and things. So yeah, there, there is a further reading at the very last slide. Um, yeah, I guessed and I found it. <laughs> yeah, most of the further reading is just read um, all of Hadley Wickham's books because uh, he's a, a god. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, those are... Um, this is absolutely brilliant material on functional programming in the Advanced Star book. Um, I've also linked out some um, kind of um, other examples in other programming languages and um, some some of the very theoretical parts from mathematics behind this. Um, but yeah, um, and yeah, partial to add NAR into a function. Yes, that's in one of the exercises. Um, I kind of want to show it now, but that will ruin the exercise. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's an absolute perfect use case for partial application. Um, right. Um, yeah, so the next per function is um, composition. Um, and it's, I, I kind of feel like this goes hand in hand with partial application. So um, composition is just like what we talked about with mathematical functions. Um, so we've got the two examples on the left and the right um, that are basically doing exactly the same thing. Um, on the left, we've got a you know function that we fix the value um, in. Um, we run through, we say, um, we've got this function x, a function g, and we can kind of compose with the pipe. Um, that's kind of what the pipe operator does. It's composing successive function calls together. Or we could create a new function h, which composes g after f. Um, I kind of almost feel like they've got this the wrong way around in per, that um, you need to read these backwards. <laughs> um, g is going to happen after f. Uh, there is an argument that you can control that, so you can say the direction is forwards. The, the default is backwards. Um, as you can see, if we run this with four, we get 11. We run H with four, we get 11. Run it with five, we get 13. They're the same results. It's just that doing this is, is a function that can be reused over and over again. We don't need to recreate that pipe over and over again, which I mean, this is back to that earlier example. If we've got this, 30 or 40 times. That's 30 or 40 places we can make a mistake. If we create a new function that does this for us, then it's done once. I mean, these are obviously stupid examples because you could just write a function that does x times 2 plus 3, probably solved. But um, this doesn't have to just be with you know, some simple numerical operation. This could be, you know, um, entire deploy statements that you compose one after another. Um, yeah, the example on the right then is um, just to show like in this example, because we've got two arguments, um, if we're to compose here, the f function, we'd still be able to access that second variable. So if you look at the left and the right, we can say um, four comma two gives us 11. Um, but we won't be able to pass in that second argument to the G function. Um, 
but we can of course use partial application. So combine compose with partial, we can build up this complex thing. Um, I can't remember if I put an example in of this later on, but um, I'll try and explain um, without jumping to come too much. But yeah, if you can imagine that you've got um, a, su a successive step of calls that does this one thing, does the next thing, does the next thing, does the next thing. We can replace that with composition. So we just do the one thing, which is a series of function calls. All right. So this is going to be like the, the big chunk of um, the session now, but um, covering the kind of map family of functions. Um, that earlier example that we looked at with the rescaling function, um, the once once suggestion was to build a loop to this for us. So we create a for loop that says loop over all of the columns in the data frame. Um, for those that don't know for loops in R, what this is going to say is create a new variable i and set it to each one of the values um, here, in this case, the column names. So it's going to set i to the first thing, then it's going to set it to the second thing, then it's to the third thing, then it's to the fourth thing. So yeah, everything that's in this block will be run once per that thing in I. Um, so yeah, we call rescale with the data frame, the I column, um, and update that thing. But I mean, this still could suffer from like copy paste errors. Um, in this first example, you accidentally set it to um, the first thing. Um, so, I mean, this is common when you start off writing a big long thing and go, uh, I could rewrite this as a, a for statement here. And you've got it going one, two, three, four, you kind of rewrite it to be the function and you forget to change the values to be i. Um, uh, again, that could be another hands up who's done that in the past. And um, <laughs> yeah, well, I would really well, put my hand up seeing that. Um, the other issue with for loops is you can mess up this um, iteration value. Um, so yeah, our data frame has four columns. So let's say it's one four. Um, but what happens if we then pass in a different data frame that has five columns or six columns or three columns? I mean, five or six, it would just not update those last few columns. But if you only, yeah, you know, you know, sorry, if you did one to three, it just update the third three columns. But if you said five, it's going to error because it's going to say where's the fifth column. Um, so is there a better way of doing this? Um, that's where the map function comes in. So yeah, stolen from the advanced star book that it has some beautiful visuals that explains all this stuff in um, the advanced star book. Um, but the idea is the map function takes a, a vector of values. So whether that's a numeric list, well, numer numeric vector or a list or a date frame. Um, it then takes a function and it runs that function once per input. Um, so we'll explain what's happening here later, but that previous example, we can update the data frame by using the map DFC, iterating over the data frame. So that's where I was saying earlier about data frames are just lists. Um, they're a list of length, number of columns. So we iterate over each column, running rescale on that vector of values in that column. So yeah, this is map in action. Um, so let's say we, we start from a really stupid example, but we've got the values one to five. And then we're just going to create a function that doubles that number. It's just going to take a value, multiply it by two. Um, so in that we say map over values and run the double num function. Um, there's a couple of other ways of running this. You can um, use what are called anonymous functions. So an anonymous function is nothing fancy. It's just that we don't give this function a name like we did up here. So it's just going to live for the amount of time that that map 
function runs, it'll disappear afterwards. Um, so that's the one way of writing it. Uh, if you've updated to R4.1, you can just use this kind of simpler syntax where instead of writing function, you just write a backslash. Um, exactly the same. It's, it, there's no difference between the two. Um, it's just that takes, what, eight less keystrokes? Eight, seven, seven. <laughs> um, the other option is in per, there's this kind of notion of a, a formula syntax. Um, so you'd write a tilde, and then the first value in map, which is you know, the only vector, will be called dot x. So all of those will give us the same results. It's going to run that function with, you know, run double num one, double num two, double num three, four, five. And it will give us our numbers. So we get two, four, six, eight, ten. And it returns them as a list. So that's the basics of how Mac works. Runs a function once per input, um, returns a list. But lists aren't always that useful. I mean, we started off with a nice numeric vector. We ended up with a, a horrible list. Um, yeah, these print out and they just take up your entire screen. And you're cursing yourself. So is there a better way? And yeah, so per has all these like map variants. Um, so the one that we'd be interested in here is the double variant. Um, so we yeah, we run this function and we say we're expecting this function to return a double vector. And then it'll go, okay, it runs that function and it gives us a double vector as a return. Um, and we've got different variants then. We've got um, underscore character. Um, we've seen the double. There's also int. Um, my advice is pretty much always use double because um, while uh, an integer is a double, a double might not be an integer. Um, so yeah, you've got like ints of one, two, four, six, eight. Um, doubles could be 3.01234. Um, the problem in R is, if I just go back to this, so we've got um, one, something like that. If we look at the class of one, it's numeric. Numeric means it's either an integer or a double. Um, what you should say is something like class 1L, say I specifically want an integer. Um, so yeah, using map int sometimes just results in failures because R interprets something to be uh, possibly an integer or possibly a double, so it's safe and just returns a double. Um, yeah, so you've got map char, map double, um, you've got map logical. So if your function just returns true or false, um, you can use map logical. Um, there's a map raw, which is for if you've got raw vectors, which I've never come across a use case myself for the raw data type. It's um, it's more for binary data. Um, so yeah, um, probably will never use that one. Um, and the other ones are these um, data frame variants, which um, we'll touch on in more detail in a second. Um, these are really useful. But yeah, the, the big difference between map and these map variants is Imagine that you've got a function that returns um, two values. Yeah, a good example of that might be, so we've got x, we've got, um, let's just say x is one to 10. Then we've got the range function, which just gives us the range of values. Um, we could map over, you know, just put um, that into a list, so sorry into a list we've got one thing that has 10 items and we could do map list x we could call range on that um sorry i forgot to library the function so yeah map works well then with that because we return a list it kind of goes yeah i've got a result here it is if i say oh these are numbers so i can do map double um it gives some random error. The reason for this is 
map double is expecting for each input it gets one result one numeric result um, so for each input here so we had list x the first input there was the values one to ten and then it returned two things so these variants work if your function returns a single value for that input um, if they do, yeah, th these variants are really useful. Um, yeah, the, the one kind of side note is, if you've been looking at this and going, your function so far has been stupid. The, the double function, I mean, let's just create it. We've got um, double num is function x. Um, oops, double num. I could pass in that vector and it's going to run it for that vector. I mean, yeah, a lot of R is already vectorized, as we say. And it already knows that if we pass in a vector, we can run this thing over the whole vector and give us the results that we want. Um, so yeah, if it's a vectorized function, you don't ever need to use these kind of map functions. But then there are you know, other things where that function is not vectorized. Um, a great example is um, read CSV. I think they are changing that, that you can now read in multiple files at once. But it used to be that you could only read a single file at a time. Um, so if we use the map function, we can iterate through those list of files, read all the minimums. So that's kind of the, the example that we're going to look at next. Um, as I said, these map underscore df variants are super useful. Um, so they're for combining data frames together. Um, so if our function returns a single data frame, we can use that map df to return all those data frames into one. The kind of caveat there being that function needs to return the same type data frame. So it's got the same columns, you know, all very, very similar columns, um, and it will do a union of the rows together. Um, so yeah, that's what map df and dfr does. The R stands for rows. Um, DFC columns. It binds columns together. Um, I don't find DFC to be as useful as dfr. So um, yeah, I, I've not got any good examples to give you of binding the, the columns together. But yeah, perhaps you have um, something that returns a single column of values, you could use DFC to put all those columns together into one data frame at the end. All right, anyway, so in this example, we've got a, a folder um, full of um, CSVs. So if I just show that. Um, oh, where, oh, where am I? It's probably easy just to show it in our studio. Da, 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 da. So yeah, we've got this data folder with any attendances. Oh, Tom, it's very, very small. Um, this is a problem with having two versions of our studio. Yeah. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, but I did the wrong thing. I've used the Windows magnifier. <laughs> uh, does anybody know how to get rid of this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would do that. <laughs> Not, no. Um, well done. Well, sure. Windows. Um, uh, just, tools global options or tools options should change it in our studio, should it? I just said, let me just close that yeah. one. Just for some reason, I've got two versions of our open. Um, Your computer's yeah. good to not complain. <laughs> it's just 150%. Should we see that? Right. So, yeah, we've got data and then A&E attendances, and loads of files. And the way that these files are all structured, they're exactly the same columns. Um, so we've got the organization code, the A&E type. Um, for those that aren't familiar with um, accident and emergency departments in this country, there are different types. Um, so I think type one is um, a major facility with um, resus consultant-led kind of thing. Um, 
type two, I think, is for things like um, eye infirmaries. Please, someone correct me if I'm talking rubbish. Um, and there's kind of other which are the less urgent um, sensors, kind of more GP run, I think. Um, I think that's the distinction anyway. Um, but yeah, in this data, we've got the number of attendances that happens at that type and at that organization. Um, how many breaches there were against the four hour target. So they've got four hours from when they arrive um, to see, treat and discharge the patient or um, send the patient further up in the hospital, like admit them to a ward. Um, and then, yeah, how many admissions happened from those attendances. So each of these files contains the same type of data. Um, the one thing is these files don't contain the data that um, the data refers to. Um, each file is eight separate months of data. Um, and then the month comes from the file name. So uh, let me go back to slides. So we can find the list of files um, using the DIR function. So I'm just saying in the directory, um, data, a &E attendances, find all CSV files. Um, and then this argument just says, it's, instead of just giving me the name of the file, give me the, the full folder path. So later on when I come to read the file, I'll be able to actually find the file. Um, the next thing, um, this is a bit more weird, but what I'm able to do here is say, set the names of this vector. So this is going to return a character vector, which would just be these parts of the file names. Um, this then says set the names of um, the items. So I want to set them to this. Um, and with the, the set names function from per, we can pass in a function. And then that's going to take each of those um, file paths and run a regular expression on them to just extract the date. Um, if you don't understand regular expressions, um, don't worry too much, but that's just going to say, find a, um, a digit that repeats four times and a hyphen, and then a digit that repeats twice, and then a hyphen and a digit that repeats twice. So it's just finding the, the year, year, month, month, day, day part. Um, and it's just going to extract that from the string. It's going to chuck everything else away, just return the date. Um, so yeah, I'm just showing the first two files here, this, this first six of them in total. But we end up with a file path and the date that it refers to. So we've now got a vector of file names. Um, and we can simply use mapdfr with the, the read CSV function. So we don't need to use um, functions in map that we create ourselves. We can use base R functions. We can use functions from Tidyverse um, or any other package. You know, any function will do. Um, so long as it accepts you know, the type of data that we're passing in. Um, the other thing, um, in any of the map functions, it, any other argument that we pass to it will be passed to the function itself. So in this case, I say, I want to read that CSV with these column types. So um, I just happen to know that it's going to be a character, a character, and then three doubles one after the other. Um, so that's then going to run read CSV for each file with those column types. Um, the final thing here is because we're using a named vector of files, um, we can say that the ID, the, the, um, you know, the name of that um, item is going to be put into a, a column called the period. And then if we look at the results, we end up with a great big long um, data frame, um, which starts with that period. So that's come straight from the, um, the name of the item in the list, and then the rate of data. Um, because we're using that DFR, it's going to you know, take the big long list of files it's read in and just union them together um, to give us one big data frame rather than 36 individual data frames. 
making sense so far? I'll take the opportunity to take another drink. Any questions? I'm wanting questions so I can have a nice long drink. Go on. And I, look, I've even I've even come prepared today with my oh, yeah, this camera, my NHSR mug. Okay. <laughs> There's a nice so, comment. Actually, you you should read that comment before you carry on. It's a lovely comment. Um, <laughs> feeling that um, I mean, this is possibly a redundant example now because they're building some of this into um, the radar package. Um, the thing is, though, I mean, we could swap out Read CSV for Read Excel, um, or it could be that you've got um, Read weird file format. Yeah, you know, something that you create yourself to read some odd data. Um, so yeah, I mean, even though they might be bringing this stuff to ReTSV, um, it might not be in everything. Um, any planned break times? So there are going to be some exercises at the end. Um, we're about halfway through the slides. Um, I could probably take a five minute quick comfort break now um, if we want. Um, let, me just, let me just check the next part of the slide. Um, Reading I think ahead. <clears throat> Short tea break, yeah. that's what we need. More tea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just finish off this one slide because I think it, we'll move on to some other stuff afterwards. Um, yeah, so now we've created that big long data frame reading the CSVs. Um, the one problem that we had was if we looked at the um, Last thing, these periods are a character. Um, I think we'd rather them be a date, usually, um, especially if we're going to plot these in GG plot. Um, if we put in a character, it's going to just have a wobbling. Um, but we could, you know, use functional programming techniques in Dplyr. Um, I mean, the, the one way we could update that period column is just to do something like that. We say mutate period equals as date period but i mean this is that kind of same problem that we were talking about before that we write periods and periods here um we could easily mess this up we could accidentally put a capital p here and then that's going to create a new column called period um or worse we could put a capital p here and then it's going to fail it's going to give us a nice big error message um, the across function in dplyr though, it says across this column, run this function. Um, and again, any other arguments would be passed to the, the function that you're calling. Um, it's just this column could be a function, like it could be where is numeric, and it'll run a function on all of the numeric columns. Um, or you could say, you know, from um, period to type, run this function. Um, so as a kind of using functional programming in other parts of um, the R DK system, um, dplyr has this across thing. Well, I've not got many more examples of this today, um, but it's a, a really powerful technique. Anyway, um, probably time for a comfort break. It's I've got the time as um, quarter two now. We just have um, a five minute break, come back at um, 10 to. Sound good? Thumbs up. <laughs> there is a question about downloading the slides. I found the GitHub repository where you've put all your code. I've just kind of got stuck because I thought, well, it's in HTML, so it's possibly just better to take it by right clicking on the HTML slides online. Would that be the better way of getting the slides as HTML? Um, I'm, I'm just sure. going to recopy the, the links in from earlier. So I have deployed yeah. slides to um, GitHub pages. So you can, um, <coughs> uh, the third link here um, just opens up. I just think, I was thinking if you wanted a complete HTML slide deck that you could then email to colleagues. Uh, oh. Getting it from GitHub's not so straightforward, is it? Because it's all it's all actually HTML code. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, this is just hosted, so you can just send that link. Yeah, yeah, it might be better with a link. 
Yes, yeah, so that's the third link. What I've just shared again. Core. Yeah, back at eleven then. Just curious, what did you make the slides in? I don't know. Oh, I'll write that in the in the slide thing. Sharing them, it's called. And um, last year. I'll share that uh, Sylvia Canalon did a fantastic workshop for NHSR on Sharingham, which got us all started onto it. So I will get that from NHSR YouTube. <clears throat> uh, it's a very, very powerful way of creating PowerPoint presentations. They're not PowerPoint because it's it's in R. So there are markdown presentations with a lot of functionality that's added to it. So it works really well with code and interactivity. I'll find her because it, it was a fantastic um, video. So I have a great time. I have to warn you, they're very addictive. Once you get started, you'll not stop. <laughs> so just bear that in mind. Um, there we go. Slide one. Um, just seen a comment from Natalie. You should be able to just um, click left and right on the keyboard, Mouse. Here's your left and right arrow keys. Ignore you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that um, I, I have been a bit annoyed about it and I couldn't figure it out is that I wanted to use these nice slide animations, but um, for some reason, the so I've got it sliding out to the right, but if you go back slide it, um, <laughs> it still looks like it's sliding the other way. So like, disorientating, yeah, so isn't it? It's yeah. gone back a page, but um, it's the same. There animation. is a little trick though, because if you're trying to navigate like I did to the end and then back again, you can get a bit dizzy. I get dizzy with it. Is in the URL at the very oh, very yeah. end is the slide number. Change the number if you know where you're going, because otherwise you can get a bit like, whoa, it's whizzing through. <laughs> a little bit like PowerPoint, with this animation thing. You know, I feel a bit. You can cool. also press O, and it brings up a, oh. a big thing, and then you can kind of click on which one you want. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, look at that. <clears throat> and then O to go back to it. Yes, it's lovely. It's a lot of functionality. Yeah, it, it, it was just, um, we were just having a conversation at the start of the session, just how amazing sharing is. Um, it, it's so much more pleasant to work with than Excel. Like, once you kind of got that initial hurdle, like how I'm going to set things up, um, yeah, it's, it's great. And particularly the, um, the wonderful theme that um, Sylvia built for us last year. Is it called an HSR theme in this the thing? Yes. Because that's um, nice one to start with, isn't it? Yeah. Um, where to, um, not that was one. it NHSR theme, the package, or was it? Yeah. Um, I've done a template, but that's for my work. I mean, I can share the template to get people started, and then you can do your own uh, see, bits. I've just shared the um, thing. If you do, um, right, install. GitHub. So yeah, um, there's a few things in that NHR theme, but um, the, the main one really is that sharing and slides theme. Um, if people want to contribute to the package, um, That'd be great. Um, yeah, we've got a few things in there, like the NH um, colours. Um, but yeah, the big thing is the sharing and slide deck. Anyway. You can get quite interesting into slides, so you probably need to do another session on something like that. Yeah.
but I mean, yeah, it's, 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 the one thing I was saying before most people joined was like, I started off thinking about building this in um, PowerPoint, trying to get like nice formatted code chunks in PowerPoint was a nightmare. Uh, and all this is, is just a, an R Markdown document um, that just gets you know, rendered and it looks amazing. And it's all Sylvia's hard work. I've just changed the logo in the top right corner. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> anyway. So hopefully everyone's back. Um, I can't really say if you're not here, put your hands up. <laughs> it's just not going to work in a, <laughs> in a real world setting, it, let alone a, an online one, is it? You're not back, Linda. <laughs> Why are you back? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, just to kind of reiterate so far, we've kind of covered the theory of functional programming to an extent. Um, we've glossed over a lot of the real technical details. Um, we started to look at per package um, and we've seen how the map function kind of can replace um, iteration. Um, I suppose the one thing that I didn't touch on is the map function is just a for loop. Um, it's just hiding the details from you. It's that notion of being decorative rather than imperative. We're saying we, we want to leap over these things. Um, we don't really care how that thing is implemented. Um, yeah, it could be a for loop. Or, yeah, it could even be a recursive function of it's doing it for us. Yeah, it's, it's not of interest. We just want the results. We don't want to know all those steps involved. So by using you know, functional programming techniques, we make our code hopefully easier to read and follow. Right, I'll crack on with the rest of the slides anyway. Um, but we've seen like this those map underscore variants. Um, but there are, you know, that, that is only for a single vector. Um, the, the next function I want to look at is this map to function. And it's, it's exactly the same. It has, you know, there's a map to function that returns a list. Um, there's a map to underscore double that returns a double vector. Um, the difference is it's for when we have two vectors. So they've got to be vectors of the same length, um, but they don't have to be vectors of the same type. So we could have a character and a, um, a numeric. And then really stupid example here, but we could use, um, you know, iterate over the letters and a number of times. And then we could just say, repeat that character y number of times. So we use the x and y variable. Yeah, that's just the order they come in. That's the x, that's the y. Um, there's nothing special about these names here. Um, we could call them whatever we want. Um, the only time that it would be special, let's just recreate this. We've got, um, oh God, I'm breaking things. <laughs> um, let's just get back to the right slide. Sorry. No, I'm going the wrong way. I tell you, it's these slide animations are the wrong way around. <laughs> um, right. So we've got letters. Um, so we've got so A, B, C. Oh, no, sorry. Um, letters. <laughs> Got those letters, and then we've got numbers, um, which is just one to three. And then we've got it's just library per, because I keep getting that. <laughs> um, so we've got letters, numbers, and then the example I did was just something like this x, y, and paste, um, rep letters, sorry, rep x, y number of times. Um, and I'm going to say collapse equals. Oh, uh, I've just broken out of my. Trying to be too clever with um, Windows Terminal there, just completely break it. <laughs> um, 
yeah, we, we wrote it like that. We could also use that kind of per tilde syntax there. And in that case, it'd be dot X and dot Y. Um, so yeah, that's the map two function. It's quite useful if we've got two vectors to iterate over. Um, the, there is a, a, you know, a slight, it's, it's similar, but not similar, if that makes sense. Um, there's the IMAP function. So this is the indexed map function. So in this case, letters was unnamed. So the names are just one, two, three, just go along. Um, and then we can just use exactly the same function in this case, um, because the times are just one, two, three. Um, so, you know, we can use that in that way. Um, if that's a named vector, um, the IMAP will, instead of using just the number for that, it will give you the name. Um, that's map two and IMAP. Like map, um, have all the same variants. Um, they just work with two vectors as inputs. Map two, you pass the second vector. IMAP, it's coming from the, you know, the index or the name of the item. Now, that's where we've got two vectors. But what if we've got like three vectors or four or five that we want to iterate over? Also, oh, okay. Um, if you use the XY, will it break if someone else runs it on an old version of R? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you, I, I probably should have used function. Um, the reason why I'm using those um, shorthands here is purely because of trying to fit it onto the slides. Um, it's just quicker and easier to write it out like that. Um, so yeah, if you're using an older version of R, favor function, or um, if you read the um, advanced R book, it'll explain like the, the tilde syntax, like the formula syntax that um, Per uses. Um, I, I would typically prefer to use this um, kind of um, what they call lambda function syntax now in R. Um, when I'm writing anonymous functions. But it's exactly the same as writing a function, it just takes up more characters. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for pointing that out because that was kind of bad when I <laughs> sort of noted that earlier. Um, anyway, PMAP is for where we've got multiple vectors that we want to iterate over. So we've got map, we've got map2, and then PMAP. Um, again, all the same underscore variants. Um, as a really naughty example, imagine that we've got um, a list that contains three items. Those three items are the values one to three, the values four to six, and the values seven to nine. Um, and then we can do yeah, one plus four plus, oh, sorry, one plus times four plus seven, and two times five plus nine, uh, eight, <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, that's how PMAP works. We need to pass in the values. We have the function that has as many arguments as there are things in that um, list. So it has to be a list, this does. Um, okay. The list is the only thing that is um, heterogeneous in that way. And then, yeah, we would just write a function body to return a value. Um, if you use PMAP double, the values. Um, the, the neat thing about PMAP is if we were to write um, names for these items in the list, uh, it will then execute the function using those names. So we need to make sure that the names match the function. But if you see like the, the difference between these two examples, this second line is exactly the same. It's just the first line we name the items. And I happen to name the items kind of in reverse to the, the um, argument call. So instead of it being x, y, z, I've gone z, y, x. And you'll see we get very different results because we're putting these values now here and these values here. Hopefully that's clear. Um, it's quite a clever way of um, handling this stuff, as we'll see 
shortly is a you know very powerful technique when you're working with data frames in particular. Um, but yeah, just to know that the name of the list item will get passed to the function, uh, the function's name. So where where I think you know PMAP is super powerful. Let's imagine that um, we've got we, we create a plot. We love this plot; it's wonderful, and we want to then create multiple versions of that plot. We could do faceted plots in ggplot. That's super easy. We, you know, works well up up, up, up to a point. You know, if we had three hundred plots. Um, facets are going to start to look pretty cramped. You know, if you've got maybe 30 things going across that way, 10 things going down there, all this pot's going to be really teeny tiny. Or it might be that just that, you know, those plots need to be separate anyway, um, for whatever reason. Yeah, using them in different um, page on the slide deck or something like that. So what we can do is we can create individual plots. So we're going to step through a couple of different things here. First, we're going to um, run through and show how we can create the, the plot object. And then we'll iterate through and save the plot to the disk. Um, but to start with, we're, we're going to work with that same data that we loaded up earlier on. Um, we're just going to use it from the um, NHSR data sets package. Um, so if we library the NHSR data sets, we can just do some quick, simple um, dplyr groupings. So um, if we group by the type and then the um, period, summarize um, and sum the attendances. So this will give us for each period and each A and E type, how many attendances that happened. Um, it's going to drop that last group. So we're just going to be grouped by type. And then we can use the nest function. So if you haven't seen the nest function before, it's a little bit weird, but all of those other columns that we had, so in this case to be, well, at this stage, we're going to have type period and attendances. That's what we're going to be left with. Um, and we're going to have, we've got 36 months of data per um, type. When we nest that, we're going to be left with this kind of data frame here, where we've got a type column and a date column. And the data column is a list that contains a tibble per row. And they, you know, those data frames are 36 rows, two columns. So that's going to be the period and the attendances. Is that clear so far? <laughs> um, hopefully that shows what's happening. It looks a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just like grouping our data. It's just grouping it into one tiny little ball. Right. So the next thing that we'd want to do is create our function to draw our plot. Um, here's an example of this function. So we'll take some data and the type. Um, so those are the column names from that last step. Um, we've just seen why that's important when we're using PMAP. Um, but in this case, we could plot our data. So our data has got um, the period and attendances column. Which we're kind of just touching on. We just draw you know, a simple plot that just draws the line and the point and adds the title. So um, it's going to add the type of any attendances there is. I'm sure you can create much more fancy and interesting plots um, than this. Just a toy example. Um, and we can just quickly test this. So from that A and E types data, we could just select the first row of data. Um, but because it's separated over the two columns, we need to go, you know, take the type column, take the first thing, take the data column, take the first thing. And we can test that plot. And it works. So now we just need to glue it all together. What we want to do now is iterate over all of the rows of the data in that. Um, a and E types data that, that summarized um, data frame that we created and run this function once per row. And that's where PMAP comes in. 
So, I mean, in this case, we're returning the plot. So the plot is a kind of weird object. So there isn't a pmap gg plot option. So we're just going to use the box standard pmap. But yeah, we iterate over the rows of data in A and E types. And we call um, the A and E plot function on that data. And then we can see the three different plots it's created for us. Um, and that's pmap. Um, if we just run map on this, the way that that's going to run is it's going to look at it, it's, it's going to see that data frame as the input, which is going to treat as a list. And then it's going to map over each of those two columns. So instead of iterating over the rows, it'll iterate over the columns. And then our function won't work. Um, but using pmap, it kind of looks at the entire picture and it will run through line by line in that list or data frame. So hopefully that, that explains why I wanted to bang on about vectors at the start. <laughs> Just understanding the data a little bit will help you figure out how these functions can work. Um, yeah, question, Nick? Yeah, hi, I'll just uh, put my hand down before I forget. So I just actually, I wasn't, I wasn't following this bit. Um, and I, I think I approached this a different way. So can I just clear this up? So you're using PMAP here so that you iterate over the rows. It's not it. anything to do with it being uh, like a parallel operation, like as in taking from multiple columns. It's, it's going across the rows. I, I've always approached that by either doing it with a row wise or I don't know. Uh, can you maybe just explain that part again? I didn't quite follow, and I, I'm just maybe my hearing it again might help. Yeah. So um, if I go back to slides, so we started off with um, our data that was like an individual row per month per A and E type, um, which we've grouped to type and period. Summarize that to give us just the sum of attendances, and then we've summarized that once more with the nest function. So the nest function gives us for each A and E type a data frame. So we've got kind of a group. Yeah, I, follow, I follow all of that. Um, I, I would then what what I was confused with is that usually then if I wanted to iterate over all rows, I would apply a, a deploy a row wise statement which groups it by row and then just do a mutate map as opposed to a pmap. And I'm just I wasn't sure how that yours does what yours is doing. I thought the PMAP operated differently. That's maybe that's uh, helped clear up what I'm struggling with. So, yeah, the difference would be um, at this stage, um, you'd have um, your data and you'd do that mutate and you would say on that data column, do this thing. Um, but that's going to you know, run that function in each row this is saying run it over everything all at once so if we've got like six or seven different columns if, if instead of grouping just on like that one column to nest we grouped on many many columns we kind of just get all of that for free in the function call um i'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head maybe you've got something like data that's grouped at month specialty hospital site and gender random variables. We could group all that data into a you know nested data frame and then have a function that expects all of those things as an argument and create a plot based on those. Sorry, am I I don't want to be funny here. Do you mean to put AE types dollar data in that PMAP call? No. 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 So that's this, okay. this function has um, arguments um, the type and the data. Oh, right, yeah, OK, OK. Uh, the data has those two columns. So because it knows that the, you know, it's, it's got that data and it knows those are column names, and it's got that function and it knows those column names, it just pushes it all into the function for us. Yeah, I think it's clicked now, thanks. I, I get it now. It, I mean, it, it, this stuff isn't necessarily easy to understand, especially when we're doing stuff like this where it's kind of figuring it all out for us. But that's part of the beauty of this decorative style of programming. We're not having to say, this is how I want to do the thing. It's saying, I've got this data, I've got this function, do it all for me. 
Yeah, no, I, it's, I've never seen it this way around. I, I totally get it now. It just it took me a moment for the penny to drop because I would approach it in a, you know, when you have an approach and when someone does it in an entirely opposite way, it's almost impossible for you to like, but that's what it was. So I, I have actually followed it now. Thanks for taking the time to explain that. That's actually helped a lot. Cheers. No, um, I'm glad I could go through that. I mean, it, it, as I say, it's not necessarily easy. This, isn't, this is why functional programming does get a bad rep because there's a lot of magic that happens. Um, and then there's also usually a lot of um, complex kind of terminology that's thrown about. Yeah, um, whenever I talk about it, I don't know, I always say that it's easier to read but harder to write, whereas like for loops are easier to write but harder to read. It's kind of, it's where you want to put the cost in basically. Yeah. So anyway, we've now got, I mean, I've, I've shown all these off. I, I literally just wrote the code plots one, plots two, plots three um, in each of these. Um, so this is just a list that contains three ggplot objects. Um, we probably want to do something more useful with them, like save them to disk. So this is where the kind of, um, I'll, I'll introduce the walk function. Um, and we've got walk, walk to, p walk. Um, we're going to use walk to in this case. Um, what the walk functions do differently to map is map is meant to go from you know take some vector and map it to another thing um what walk will do is it'll step over each of those things and it'll run a function on them and it'll kind of throw away the results it'll, it'll just give you the original input back um the idea of this is if we want to use something that does a side effect um so you know we start off saying that functional programming oh we want to avoid side effects side effects are terrible um and they kind of are um, because you know saving to disk could fail if your disk is a network disk and that suddenly disappears. Um, we'll touch on how we can improve that in a bit. But um, what we want to do here is save the files to the disk. So I kind of like to isolate those bits, just run that separately. That's why I didn't write that in the last function. Yeah, we could have built the function to create the plot, save it all in one go. Um, but in this case, we've got our plots, and then we can just run the gg save function once for each of those things. Um, so in this case, I'm using the walk to function. Um, we've got the plots object, um, and we can create um, file names. So in this case, I'm just going to save it to the plots folder, um, give it a plot type as a kind of start name, put in the, the type, and then put you know, png at the end. Um, you know, reiterate over the file names, the plots we call gg save. Um, gg save has the arguments file name, plot, um, and it runs it that way. Um, so that's why I've kind of set it up like that. Um, yeah, so we run that. You give us some outputs saying how it's saving the file um, because I didn't specify how big an image I wanted. Um, and then we could list all the files in that plots folder. And we can see it create them for us. So I think that's kind of a, a typically quite useful pattern that we we build some data up and then we you know, save the plots or maybe we've got like an R markdown document that we want to run multiple times um, with different parameters. So I've got an example of that in the exercises. Um, we start doing our first thing and then we use the walk functions to step over, run you know, whatever it is that we need to do. Um, saved results to disk or something like that. How's that? Everyone happy with that so far? Right. Cool. So that's all of the, the map functions that I think are worth running through. I think there's one or two more that are in um, per. Um, Though uh, you know, vanishingly rare to use them. Um, the next kind of big function um, in per is reduce. Um, so map was working to go from you know x amount of things to give us x amount of results. It's literally just doing a one-to-one -one mapping of the thing to the other thing using a function. Reduce, as the name probably implies, is taking an input 
and collapsing it down somehow. So reduce takes a vector of length x and it returns one value. Um, so the way that it works, I mean, this is an image solved from advanced style. I'm not sure whether it makes it as clear, but imagine we start off with these four things. And it's going to start off running, you know, um, start off down here. It's going to take that thing and that thing, combine it into a single result. And then it's going to combine that with this thing and the combination of those two things. And then it's going to take that result and combine it with, you know, in this case, the last item. So that's probably a, a much simpler explanation of that. Um, we've got the numbers one, you know, one to four, one, two, three, four, and the plus function. And we could call reduce on that. So that's going to start doing one plus two, three. And it's going to take that result, three, and add it to the next value, which is three, and you get six. And then it's going to take that value, six, and add it to four, and it'll finally give us 10. So, yeah, I mean, that's a stupid example because we could just call sum on <laughs> the function. But if we have some, you know, some binary function, a function that takes two arguments, and we want to, you know, combine everything in a list into a single result at the end, that's where reduce comes in use. Um, I tend to find very little use for reduce in R. In other programming languages, it's far more useful. Um, and in particular, if you're doing other types of programming, like I think some of the data analytics stuff just doesn't benefit as much from reduce. Um, but I have found cases where there was like um, some geospatial stuff where um, I, I think I was starting off with multiple. If you don't know geospatial stuff, <laughs> Um, don't worry too much about the details, but I started off with something like the, a map of Great Britain, and it was it had like all of the little islands, um, and I wanted to try and crop it just to be Great Britain without the islands. Um, and because you've got these multi polygons, it's made up of all of the little islands as separate blobs. So I just want to find the biggest one. Um, and th this is a function that says find the area of these this item. Um, so I could start off with finding the area of a thing and the area of the other thing, and then just returning the thing that was bigger. And then we move on to the next two. So we have the, the one that won out in the previous times, the next candidate, we just compare the two again. We step through and so we end up with just the biggest thing. Um, and so it's harder to find use cases for reduce in R. Um, if anybody ever runs and goes, oh my god, this was like <laughs> that's the perfect use case. Please tell me. I'd love to know. Um, I haven't added this to the slide, but there's also accumulate. Um, accumulate is kind of more like this example that I've got right at the bottom. Um, instead of returning a single value, it returns all the intermediate steps. Um, that's quite useful for debugging a reduce. Um, just so you can see what's happened at each step. Um, so yeah, where is reduce useful? This is an example borrowed from Advanced Star. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a good example of why it's useful, but in this case, we have some lists of, well, we have a list of numeric vectors, so four numeric vectors. Um, and what we want to do is run the intersect function. So the intersect function takes two numeric vectors and say what values appear in both. But it only takes two numeric vectors and returns a single numeric vector. Um, so we could run intersect with the first two things and find the intersection of those. And then run the intersection of you know, those first two things with the third thing. And it'll give us an answer like that. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm struggling to find these cases, <laughs> but if someone does, please let me know um, so I can make these slides better. <laughs> um, 
So fewer things we've reduced. Um, what it will do is it will pick the um, initial value for you um, generally. Um, so let me just go back um, to that really stupid example. In this case, it's going to start off the initial value as one, and then it's going to run one with the next value, which will be two. Um, there are cases where that might not be the case, that you need to supply an initial value. Um, so I've come up with a really stupid example. Oops, I'm going the wrong way through my slides. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do here is, with those numbers that we created in the previous example, if we ran through and sums those values in each vector and then create the big long string, you know, um, this is one way that we do it. In this case, we'd have an initial value of an empty string. We start off with the empty string and the sum of those values. We'll combine it so we get a space at the start because we've got something, and then 93. And then that's our string, which we're going to combine with the next sum. Um, again, sorry, this is a crap example, uh, <laughs> but hopefully it shows how you, you know, this stuff can work. Um, the other thing as well is you can change the direction that reduce runs in. So you can have it run backwards instead. Um, so same example as above, but running backwards, 7791, 10293. Um, sometimes that, I mean, you can see in that case, you get different results. Um, that might not be the case. Um, yeah, if we did that um, first example where we're just adding successive numbers together, um, that operation just happens to give you the same results. Um, might not always be the case, though. So that's where you've got a direction argument. That's reduce. If reduce doesn't make any sense, you can't think of any good use case, leave can I. Um, any questions on that or any suggestions? <laughs> no. Let's say reduce is way more useful in other programming languages, um, particularly ones that aren't vectorized by default. Like, you know, a programming language that doesn't have sum, like R does, just summing numeric values, can be implemented with reduce. Right. Um, so the next two functions that are, the only is a super useful in, um, per are the safely and possibly functions. Um, so with um, a map statement, if an error happens at any point, the whole thing just throws away your results, which can be super annoying if it, <laughs> yeah, you've got like one thing in a big long computation that fails. Um, so here's a stupid example. Let's say we've got a function and it only runs for values um, up to three. If you get a value over three, it goes, oh my God, too big, crashes. Um, okay, we can run that function. Um, I've wrapped it in a try here just to stop the R markdown document from crashing. <laughs> but um, if we run that, that's the result that we get. We don't see any of the other values. So the first helpful function that Per gives us is possibly. Um, possibly says, give me a function and give me a, a value that will return if this thing fails. Um, so in this case, I say NA. And then we run our function, which I mean, it's only ever going to return the input. We get one, two, three. And then because four is bigger than three, we get NA. Um, so yeah, you can imagine if you're reading files from um, disk, if one of them fails, you could just say possibly and null, and it, it'll just give you nothing back. Um, yeah, that might not be what you want. Um, you know, having a file missing is usually a bad thing. But uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's you'd just rather carry on, um, not worry about it, especially if you've got possible junk stuff being given to you. Um, so yeah, related to possibly is safely. Safely is slightly different in that what it will do is um, you don't need to give it a, a failure value. Um, it will return two things for each input. It will return the result 
um, if it was successful, um, and it will return an error message. Um, so we've got some examples of this in the exercises where you can step through and I'll, I'll show you kind of how you can work a bit more usefully with this um, possibly and safely. Um, but these are really great functions that, I mean, you don't even need to use them with um, just per map stuff. You can just use them anywhere. Um, all you're doing is wrapping your other function um, inside there. Um, as a little side note, if you're creating an anonymous function, you would define it here where the function is meant to be. You wouldn't write the anonymous function and then safely, um, safely and possibly a wrappers around the function. Uh, we're on the home stretch now. Um, some of these are useful, but not everyday kind of things. Um, the first is keep and discard. So I kind of think of these like filter that work with lists or vectors in general. Um, so keep take um, a vector as an argument, and then what we call a predicate function. So a predicate function will take a value as input and it will return a single true or false value for that input. Um, or yeah, in the case of a vector, it will take you know, the vector of values and it will return one true or false value for each thing, um, potentially. But in this case, um, this function will return, you know, if true or false for one, or two, or three, or four, or five. Um, so yeah, say so keep the even numbers, get two four <coughs> and we've also got um the discard function which is just the inverse of keep so yeah in dplow we have filter but we don't have a, a not filter um keep and discard are um the complements of one another um and the other thing that per has is this negate function so negate is like not but it's applied to a function so while not works on a logical value only, negate takes a function that returns either true or false and then turns that into a function that returns false or true. Hope that makes sense. So we end up with um, keep negate is even being the same as discard. Um, right. The next ones are sum every and none. Um, I'm just going to rush through these a little bit because I don't think they're as important um, to really fully understand. But if you know the any and all functions in um, base R, um, they take logical vectors and any will return true if any one of those vectors was true. Um, all will return true if all of them are true, um, as the names would suggest. Um, but these two functions expect logical vectors to start with. Um, some every and none work on a vector and then they take a predicate function um, and then do the same as you know any and all and the inverse of all for the none function um, so again we've got these like list of values um, imagine if we were to sum these values one two three gives us six four six gives us 15 you know, so on and so forth we could then do a, a, a you know, create a function that says like sum the values and check if it's over five. So in this case, we run, run the sum function. Um, the sum of this is greater than five, so yeah, true. Um, is every value greater than five? Yep, five. Yeah, but um, are none of the values greater than five? I mean, well, they're all greater than five, so we get false for that. And we can try it with some different vectors. So in this case, we use greater than seven. Um, yeah, we get some that are greater than seven, but not everyone's greater than seven. So this one isn't. Um, and yeah, these two are greater than seven, so none fails. And then finally, we could do one where none triggers, but every and some don't trigger. Um, Final actual slide. So I, I kind of said that I'd talk about parallel computation and I'm giving one slide to it. So if you're hoping for loads, I'm really sorry. But um, if all of that map stuff makes sense, um, that you know, we use map to 
iterate over a bunch of stuff and return some mapping to another version of that value. Um, the fur package is quite literally a dropping replacement. Um, so instead of map, we have future map and all of those variants. Um, so this slide just kind of shows how to set this up. Um, the, the part on the left is some setup that you need to do at the start. So you say, I want to run this in um, on you know, 10 CPUs in this case. Um, if you're on Windows, you have to say multi-session. Um, if you're on Linux or Mac, you definitely want to use multi-core. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details on this, but Linux and Mac are better at this kind of parallel computation than Windows is. Um, Windows has to start up an individual R session for each of those 10 workers. Um, so that can actually become quite slow and painful. Um, if you're working with like a large data set, you need to copy that large data 10 times. Um, Linux and Mac is something, it, well, it has something called process forking where it, it's able to kind of look back at the old bit of data without copying it. Anyway, um, this is a really stupid function. It's just going to sleep for half a second before returning the value. Um, and then we can do a kind of sequential map. And yeah, it's hardly surprising. We've got 10 things. We sleep for half a second. It takes about five seconds to run. Um, we can then run it in parallel. Um, sleeping is never stupid. No, it's not. I missed out on sleep last night and I'm really sad about it. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, the um, the fur package has this future map um, function. Um, it's literally just the same as this, except it does it in parallel. And it figures out how to return all the results to you. Um, the one thing that you might think is, I mean, we've got 10 workers. Um, we've got 10 things. This should take half a second, right? Mm. <laughs> um, the vagaries of how computers work um, here. I mean, it's, because we, we've got other things running in the background, we're probably not able to use all 10 of those workers straight away, so there's a bit of a delay. Um, so, yeah, your mileage may vary. And this is where it probably runs better on Linux because Linux tends to have less things running in the background, so these workers will start up quicker. And also in like a real world use case of this, you're probably doing this because things are taking more than half a second. Um, a great example I had before was um, rendering multiple R markdown documents. And each one would take around about five to 10 minutes to render. Um, and I was doing, I think 11 of them for all of the STPs in the West Midlands. Uh, well, the Midlands, sorry. Um, but I could run it all in parallel, absolutely no issue. Um, and it then went from being like an hour at a time to render, I think it was, to about 10 minutes. So it's quite nice. Um, and it was literally just changing to um, future map. Um, yeah. That is pretty much it for the slides. The last slide is just a list of resources. So the first one is from Arthur DS. Um, the sectional functions is really good, especially if you're not too familiar with writing functions. Um, I definitely recommend reading that. Um, and then the next four, um, well, seven really, but um, from the Advanced Star book, um, I think the name is a little bit off-putting. It's, I don't think of it as being too advanced. Um, but the final few chapters do get a bit more complex, but Certainly the part on vectors, um, functions and environments is really understandable. It goes into a lot more detail than Arthur DS does um, and it will help you understand some of those kind of vagaries like um, a data frame just being a list. Um, so I, I saw a question up a second ago about um, does per work with data table? It should do because all a data table is, is a data frame and all a data frame is, is a list. Um, the, only slight caveat on that is data table may have some better approaches already built in because they have their own kind of ecosystem. Um, it, it just particularly the, the reason why data table is 
so good. You know, it's good to what it does is because it built indexes on the data and things like that. Um, so potentially you may find that using map is worse than using some of the data table syntax and stuff built into data table. Um, but I mean, map is also about just running things individually on rows and you're running it on every row. So there probably aren't many speed ups that you can make anyway, if you're needing to run things one by one. Um, so yeah, read all the, um, the advanced R stuff. Um, these next two links, um, even though it's all about JavaScript, I don't think you really need to know too much JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript's based on C, R's based on C, very similar looking languages. In, in some respects. So you can probably get away with just reading through the stuff and understanding what's going on. Um, a language that definitely isn't based off of C is Haskell. And um, if Chris Beely was here, he'd be shouting at me right now for banging on about Haskell. But Haskell is a really wonderful, fun purely functional programming language. It's got a little bit of a steep learning curve um, because all that stuff that I was saying about functional programming getting a bad rep. <laughs> the, using complex and unnecessary terms. Haskell is one of the worst examples <laughs> of doing this. Um, but this is a nice book that kind of eases you into it, this, I think. Um, and if you really want to get into functional programming, it's definitely a language to learn. Um, yeah, the next few links on category theory, um, that's kind of the basis for functional programming um, from the mathematical theory point of view. Um, it's a very weird part of mathematics that I don't really understand after <laughs> watching all of the lectures that I've linked. Um, it, it's basically an abstraction of mathematics, which is an abstraction of everything already. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, a, you know, it's there if you want to do, delve into it. Um, but the, the last link is just, a, it, it's a really interesting lecture. Again, it's based on JavaScript, but I think it's accessible and it's about um, lambda calculus, which um, is what kind of functional programming was originally derived from. Um, and it goes through some really weird and wonderful things like um, numbers can be represented as functions. Um, so yeah, quite a cool, um, clever little lecture. Um, but that's about it, we'll run into the, um, the exercises now. So I'll just stop recording. Um,